I wish you a wonderful good morning. Nice to have you with us again. And let's start with a prayer. I thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity that we have this morning to come in front of you and to know that you are already there awaiting us. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you work in us, that you are so able and so gentle and so wise to speak to us, to show us things. And I pray this morning that you go on um, yeah, changing our hearts. Amen. Amen. Normally, our plan for the day is not to blow up everything and to fail utterly. Normally, we really have the goal and the wish and the hope for this day that we have a blessed day, that everything went a good way. And in every situation, we react in a good way and that we can be a blessing for people. Um, so normally our goals for the day are quite good. And also for the next uh, time in our lives, we wish to be the best version of ourselves that we can be. We want to be right that version of us that God created and God wants us to have and wants us to be. And the hope is also explained as a firm and joyful expectation that God is still will do still great do uh, will still do great things in my life and through me and that is a wonderful hope and of course in daily life you have different uh, types of hope there's a hope maybe that Bayern München will uh, win the championship but that does not change my life at all <laughs> but if there are other questions like if your princess dream princess will say yes or no to your marriage proposal that will change your life <laughs> so there are some hopes in your life that do not change you at all but other hopes they they really change you and really change the way you live the way you decide things your priorities you have your wishes your plans your expectations it changes everything and the hope that god ch will change me will go on changing me um, i think is a very big hope in our lives we want to be the best mother that we can, could be or the best father I ever could be or the best son the best uh, worker or the best colleague the best uh, s servant here in church oftentimes we have responsibilities maybe in the, uh, the human context but also maybe that God puts uh, responsibilities on your heart to serve and to care for the bro your brothers and sisters in your family or in the church and we have the wish, wish to do it the best way it could ever possibly be done. And this is a great encouragement we find in the Bible that God has the same hope for you. And you can open your Bible to my one of my favorite chapters, one of my uh, favorite 300 chapters in the Bible, <laughs> you find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which is a very interesting chapter because it talks much about that the first half of the Bible called the Old Testament and how it does connect to the New Testament. Because we as Christians, we tend to only look at the Old Te uh, New Testament and forgetting what has been done and forgetting why the Old Testament was not so good. And this chapter explains us much about the Old Testament and also uh, why the New Testament is so precious and why we can have that big hope in our lives. And we see that in 2 Corinthians 3 that the Old Covenant has been done away. God was not satisfied with the Old Testament, with the Old Covenant from the beginning. So God's plan was not the Old Covenant and then after some years he realized, oh man, I did a mistake. Let's throw it away. Now I do everything again. No, that was not God's plan. God planned the old covenant to be exactly like that. But he knew from the beginning it is not that what really will bring the big change in the lives of people. So in, in verse 11 and 12 it talks about that the old covenant was done away and that now in the new covenant God's glory is uh, been visible and it even talks in a very strong language about the old covenant it talks about the covenant of death and of condemnation and there are very heavy words um, and of course if the old covenant was of condemnation and about death it brought death the new covenant it brings life and it brings uh, yeah god's 
God's glory. And in verse uh, 17 and 18, I read, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from what? We see in a second, and now 18 is my main focus this morning. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So in very simple words, God tells us here, his goal for your and for my life is to change us. To bring glory in our lives. And that is a great encouragement. If I have the wish to be a better mother, a better worker, a better father, a better son, a better whatever. If you have the wish that um, you, the people around you see God's glory in you. That is a wish coming from the Holy Spirit. And no matter your past was or your uh, present is, no matter your, your emotions, no matter the people around you, no matter how many people you have that support you, you have one truth, you have one promise that supports you. It is God himself promising you, I have the plan in your life that my glory is seen in you. And that is wonderful. That is wonderful because oftentimes we allow ourselves that lies from the past, lies from our circumstances, that they keep us back. And that they um, yeah, uh, rob us of the hope of change. God will and wants to change you. And that is such a wonderful truth and promise of God's faithfulness that he is not shocked by your sin yesterday. He is not shocked and will not be shocked by your failings that will come tomorrow. <laughs> He's not shocked. His covenant is firm and he will stand to his word when he promises you things. And let us look at that interesting verse. It says here in verse 18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In the first second, that verse maybe is very, very complicated. <laughs> um, and we, we will uh, cut it in part a little bit, so it's, I think, not that hard. Yeah, it talks about that we all, that we look on God's glory with an unveiled face. Why an unveiled face? What is this? picture coming from. We see it a little bit later that in verse 15 and 16 Paul is talking about Moses in the desert when they were with the people of Israel when he met God face to face. His face sh uh, was shining because God's glory was reflecting in an uh, earthly physical way. And he says here in verse 15 and 16 um, in the same chapter, he said, Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So God, so Moses put a veil on his face in the Old Testament. And this is an example that Paul uses for the Jews when they read God's word, the Old Testament. They have like a veil over their face, not being able to to see God's glory. And the question is, do we oftentimes have a veil of our eyes, of our hearts, that we do not see the glory of God when we open that book? And normally, um, yeah, every person that reads the Bible, that starts re reading the Bible, we have a veil. I just had a very interesting conversation with my colleagues in my work um, the day before yesterday. About one hour we discussed what the plan of God for our life. And what was a wonderful opportunity for me to share God's truth. And one colleague that I have, she shared her struggles or her, um, yeah, uh, being bored about the Bible. Because she, she, once she read a little bit of the Bible and she was bored. She's not interested about the Bible. She tries to believe in God her way. She tries to put everything into her soup of religion that she understands up to this day, but the Bible, it's a very strange book. And I think it's even with us being Christian over years, we oftentimes have a veil over our hearts because it says here, Paul used that picture that um, 
we see his glory like in a mirror. Another translation uses that, that word that saying as in a mirror. And the, the Jews, they just saw the letter and it brought death. It brought boredom. <laughs> and sometimes we read the Bible and it does not bring us glory. It brings us maybe glory where you open your Bible in the morning and you are fighting with your eyelids <laughs> to stay open. And that should not be because God's word is so uh, filled with his glory. But oftentimes we see just the letter and we see not the mirror. Because the mirror, like also in James 1.25, tells us who I have become. Just one, uh, two chapters later, not in two, uh, 3 verse 17, but in 5.17, Paul says that we have become a new creation. But the question is, do we start realizing that we have been changed? Do you just see the letter that asks things of you that you feel not a being able of uh, doing? Or do you see a mirror showing you who you have become? And that will change it all. If you believe the gospel that not you should change, but you have been changed from the inside. Of course, we need to work that out. But the starting point must be the finished uh, work of the cross that tells you your old creation has been died, has been crucified with Christ, and you have become new. If you do not start there, if you still believe you, you are an old creation, if you still say you have the DNA of Adam, then you never will see the glory of God. Because the Bible so clearly says the old DNA of Adam, it died with Jesus on the cross. And if we change it, if we say we are still the old creation because we feel it, we will never run well. And we, see, we will not see the glory that God put inside of us. Like in Colossians 1.27 it says, The hope of glory, the hope of glory is Christ in us. It's the finished work in us that uh, will bring the change. And how will I experience change in my life? For this we want to jump to John 15 for one verse and also in John 17 where God describes us how he works in us and also how much he loves us. We read in John 15 5 that Jesus explains to his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The point where we run out of gas, where our motor stops, is the question of love. And oftentimes we do the mistake to hope and ask for human love much more than we hope for God's love. So our motor, our engine, our machine runs with the gas of human love oftentimes. And we are not happy if that um, gas is not brought to me by you. <laughs> and we forget that Jesus says the gasoline that you need is not human lo love. Is this God's love. It's spiritual love. And the love that you receive from people, it should be a good appetizer. But it's not the satisfying and strengthening meal. So it's normal for us being not satisfied and not being happy with people, how they treat us. And it should be and it must be that way. Because God did not plant human relationships as uh, yeah, the source of my power, the source of my peace, the source of my joy. That means your family will not treat you always right and that is good. Your boss will not always treat you good and this is good. Because otherwise we are so easily tempted to believe the lie that people, it's the mission and the calling of people to make me happy. It's not. As one man said uh, recently, uh, God did not marriage or family or even church to make you happy. No, he created it to kill you. To kill your old flesh, your old nature, your expectations that you put on people to make you happy. It's there to kill you and to bring that need into your life 
to put your expectation fully on God. And in John 17, we have a wonderful verse, um, how much God loves us and what that love should bring and produce in my life. It says here in John 17, 23, that Jesus says to his disciples after he prayed, and I in them, and you, oh, he's still praying, uh, I in them and you in me. He's praying to the Father that he wants to have that unity, that perfect unity and union with the Father, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Two very, very interesting things. The world should see that the Father loves me, loves us, in the same way as the Father loves the Son. And the first thing is, are you aware of the great love that God has for you? That Jesus even realizes, God, you have the same love for all of them. The same love as you have for me. God loves you so much, much, much more than we ever could grasp. Oftentimes, we do not experience God's love because we think God is not happy with us because I did a mistake yesterday. God does not see you as the mistake. He knows you did a mistake. But you are not a mistake. You are the greatest desire that God has. That you are more and more changed into the likeness of His Son. And this love should change us so much that everybody around me sees us, sees it. That I know that God loves me so much. The world should see that you are so loved by God. And why not starting every day realizing how much God loves me. And not setting your standards so low that you want to just improve a, bit, a little bit. Get a little bit of blessing from God. No, His plan is that through you, your family, your workplace will meet the glory of God. That we see um, the, how much God loves the uh, Son and you, that everybody around you sees that in your eyes, in your words. And this is something very precious to pray for. And this should be our hope, that God is faithful to His promise, that His glory might be seen in your life. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for this wonderful morning. I thank you for your promise that you want to keep on changing and transforming us. It's not our own efforts only. It is your power. It's your Holy Spirit. And it's your promise that you will keep on transforming our lives. That everybody around us sees how much love comes out of us. Because every morning, so often we realize and we remind ourselves that you love us so much, even in, with the same love that you loved your, your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that wonderful truth. Amen. Amen.